Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to App Workshop number three. Thank you for joining us here on a Friday afternoon in prime Christmas party season. We appreciate uh, you being here, and welcome to those on the live stream that are joining us. Uh, my name is Dan Shaw, and I'm the Innovation Manager for South Eastern Sydney, uh, Local Health District, and the co-chair of the New South Wales Innovation Network. This is my colleague, Yanni Swift, who is the uh, innovation Manager at Northern Sydney LHD and the other co-chair of the Innovation Network. Before we get started today, I'd like to acknowledge traditional owners of the land on which we meet our Aboriginal Elders past, present and welcome any of our Aboriginal colleagues here today. So a bit of housekeeping before we kick off. Uh, we do have a very full agenda today and some very exciting speakers uh, to round out our workshop series. So in the event of the fire alarm sounding, um, please follow myself out one of the exits and we'll meet our trusty um, AV support team on the way out who will guide us out of the building. Bathrooms are located out the door here around past the registration desk and then up the hall. Uh, phones, if we could just pop those on silent. Um, we know that you all have to take calls, so you can just pop outside to do that. To those live streaming, we have over 100 people live streaming today from across the state, so we welcome all of you and thank you uh, for your time in joining us. We recognise at the last workshop we had some sound issues, so we, we've done a lot of testing today to um, ensure that doesn't happen again. For those online, we're not using Slido for questions. Um, we ask you to open the chat window on your live streaming link and pose your questions through there. We are a bit light on the ground in terms of support today. Uh, South East and Sydney has their annual public meeting and my team are off putting up 240 bright spot posters um, and displaying those at the APM of work happening across the district. So I'll be running up and down the stairs um, taking questions for our presenters. So we will finish at five and then we invite all of you in the room to join us for drinks uh, across the road. Um, we will circulate recordings of the workshops and presentations from our speakers once we have all of our recording consents and, and permission to share the slides. Um, it is a bit of a slow process, so please bear with us. We'll get those to you hopefully before Christmas. So um, I think that's all from me. I'll hand over to Gianni. Great. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, as Dan was saying, this is the third and final workshop in the series. Um, it is focused on research. Um, so we really hope it's a nice way to tie off the topics we've covered so far. We do encourage you, as in each of the other sessions, if you have an idea, please speak with your line manager and ensure you have their approval. Then please contact one of the innovation managers who are on the contact sheet that were provided at the door and anyone online will be sending that to you. Um, we're also encouraging you, if you do have an idea for an app, to contact Dan and myself. We will be creating a registry just so that we can support collaboration and make sure people are working together and not duplicating. Um, and with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker. So um, Dr. Rob Pellman is coming to speak Oh, I've gone the wrong way. Um, Dr. Rob Pellman has come to speak with us today. Rob is actually successfully running a business with an app interface. Um, so we thought it was a great opportunity for everyone to hear his story, um, his learnings, and then hopefully you can connect with him if you want to. So I'll just introduce Dr. Rob. He's a junior doctor and developer of the app Resident Guide, which has been built to solve problems he faced every day in hospitals. The app is used across eight New South Wales local health districts and two Queensland health services with over 2,500 registered users. So Rob, welcome. Um, thanks Gianni and Dan and thanks everyone for, for coming and uh, watching and showing an interest. So uh, I'm going to walk you through a little bit around about uh, MedApps, which is the name of the company I started and how I ended up here, and then a little bit about um, some of the processes that we've done internally in terms of how we work around new ideas and new products, and I hope that, that you find that uh, quite interesting as well. And then I'll 
hopefully try and finish up nice and early and be happy to answer any questions. So when I was an intern, uh, I uh, made a mistake. I had just started an uh, internship in the Central Coast. I'd done my week-long orientation week. I'd been given a 120-page orientation manual and uh, gone on to the wards. And one of the first things that my consultant asked me to do was to order a CT for a patient. So I jumped onto EMR, I put through the request and went around the rest of my duties. Came in the next day and the patient uh, still hadn't received their scan. So I looked into it and the reason they hadn't received their scan was because I had failed to fax off a contrast consent form. So because I'd made that one mistake, which may have been somewhere in that 120 page printout that had been sitting on the back of back seat of my car since the first day of orientation, Maybe someone had told me, but I'd forgotten because you're dealing with the information overload. I delayed that patient's journey by an entire um, bed day. I cost New South Wales Health $1,400, which is what they say a bed day costs, and I put unnecessary pressure on myself. And when you think about how our health system is designed, whether it be for nurses or for um, PGY1s and 2s, we change terms or we move to a new hospital five times a year. And so we're going into a new environment five times a year. Even if you're in the same hospital, you're still dealing with an entirely different set of procedures and policies that you haven't actually worked with before. And you're making those mistakes. You're putting, contributing to junior doctor burnout. You're um, inconvenient. Even if it is a situation like this where I haven't actually caused harm to a patient, I've delayed that patient caused inconvenience. Um, so effectively, I was, I was quite irritated at this, this problem, and um, particularly because all of the information is actually compiled and exists. But if, if we look at that problem uh, a little bit more holistically, the issues are around term rotations and settling into new jobs, dealing with uh, switchboards and being able to access the phone directory that you need. Um, you know, I'm sure we've all dealt with situations where we're calling literally the department next door, and instead of looking up the number or being able to access it, we go through switch, which might you know, be a two minute turnaround just to speak to the next department. We've got an inefficient hospital intranet that um, uh, we don't have access to protocols and guidelines when we need it. We don't have offline access. And if you listen to the discussions that go around medical education and training conferences, there's a lack of preparedness uh, that's often talked about. So Hetty talks about this a lot. Interns aren't job ready when they come out of medical school. They don't know how to consult other medical teams. They don't know how to relate to allied health or what's, you know, the, the idea of multidisciplinary team is raised at medical school, but we certainly don't know how to engage with them. Uh, we don't know how what discharge services are available. It took me, I think, nine months for me to work out what a compax was. And um, we don't know uh, how to get patients' medications appropriately. If we look just at that original problem that I mentioned before around CT scans, where the mistake I made, 7,000 first and second year doctors in, in Australia-wide, changing terms five times a year, making one of these mistakes a term, that's $49 million in uh, unnecessary bed stays. I'm not saying that my solution can fix all of it, but we think that we, you know, that's, there's so much inefficiency and the numbers add up so quickly for all of the mistakes we make. So I, um, I taught myself to code, and during internship, I uh, built this platform called Resident Guide. There's an offline first platform for delivering content. Um, we now have medical students, nursing students, and nurses on the platform as well. It's, very, it's hospital specific. So if I go to Gosford Hospital, I look up the Gosford Resident Guide, and I know now what the emergency department functions, what teams to call when, how to speak to them, how to order a CT at Gosford Hospital versus when I go to Wyong and now they've got you know, outpatient MRI and the process I go through. Or I go out to Dubbo and I flick my location across, now I've got access to the Dubbo information. Local phone directory, there's two-way interactivity so um, the users can comment on things that are incorrect. They can actually edit some of those that content directly but it will be moderated before approval so it's got that wiki-like functionality. And uh, the hospital can send out notifications to the users, so push notifications, hey, there's a barbecue on, or this is happening, or this policy's changed. Um, so it's back, it's got a full content management system on the back end. Hospitals can put up whatever they want, really. So uh, we've been going for four years, um, two years as a resident, and then a, a locum year, and then I've 
raised a, a, got a team of seven now. We talk about what we're doing uh, around three key components. So the first is around orientation and onboarding, which is the original problem that I experienced. And it's not to replace the in-person orientation, which should always be best practice, but it's to make sure that if people are going remotely or you've got people who are starting outside of the normal orientation period, you've got a digital adjunct to make sure that people have access to all of the information they need to be job ready, that they're not bumping around in the dark. So if I'm going out to Tamworth Hospital as a locum and I get the call up at you know, lunchtime on a Saturday, if I get there Saturday night, the hospital admins or the locum agency is actually able to add me to their content. And when I turn up there, I know what the case mix is, what sort of procedures I'm likely to encounter and what their, um, what, what their admission process is. The next component is around wellbeing. So obviously this is highly topical uh, Australia-wide, not just for junior doctors, but also uh, nurses and really everyone in the, in the clinical sort of space. We, um, one of my colleagues, Caitlin Weston, did a, uh, so she was a, a, she and I went to med school together. She did a Churchill Fellowship looking at junior doctor burnout and mental health last year. And she's come onto the team and is leading our engagement around a number of factors. So not only trying to work closely with the ministry and with Black Dog Institute, but also all of the site specific um, things that are occurring in each LHD to make sure that uh, this is the right sort of platform to deliver useful information. Uh, and also this ties into the actual uh, orientation and onboarding component of the platform. There's a lot of research that's come out of corporate HR that says that if you're able to deliver a good orientation and onboarding process to staff members, you have much greater staff retention, engagement and happiness. And uh, so we think that those are, these the two things actually go together. And the final component is around engagement and change management. So we've got a strong network of engaged users who continue to use this across their employment inside a LHD. So it becomes a really good avenue to communicate with doctors, send notifications out, uh, and to notify them of changes in their LHD. Uh, in, we went live in January 2015 at Wagga Hospital. And since then, we're now currently live at 23 sites in New South Wales and Queensland. We've got about 3,000 junior doctors on the platform. And this year, they've spent almost 2,500 hours in the platform. We've got really strong adoption as well. So at none of our sites is this a mandated uptake. Uh, when originally, we would have thought that it's primarily focused for interns. But as you can see, the organic adoption at these sites is much greater than just for the interns. We've got great uptake from residents and registrars and consultants and nurses as well. And this is the pattern of usage that we see across an average health district. So this health district, it's been in for, for two years. Uh, I think orange is 2017, blue is 2018. And you can clearly see the peaks uh, at the start of internship and then at each term changeover. So people are using this to work out, well, I've just gone from orthopedics to emergency, what's what's happening in emergency, what are the things I need to know. But they're also continuing to engage with it throughout the term as well. So usage doesn't drop off. So we know people are using it. We know hospitals are getting value for money out of it. And we've developed a methodology and some research around what the return is that a hospital can expect. So if we look at that same health district, there's been a 35% increase year on year in terms of the number of sessions. That's every time they've opened an app, number of page views, a smaller increase in the amount of time that they're spending in it. And we've got some, uh, done a time in motion study that says that for every minute people spend in the app, they're actually saving five minutes that they would have been trying to source that information previously. That's not to say that they're going to be, we're going to be reducing overtime, but it does mean that if you can free up for you know, a busy intern or a nurse an extra five minutes in the day then that's time that they have with a patient, that's time that they have to debrief with their team or for a coffee, and that all contrib contributes to returning a little bit of humanity to medicine, which I think is really important. Uh, for the future of MedArts, in, we've recently signed Metro North HHS in, in Brisbane. It's got two major tertiary hospitals, Royal Brisbane and Prince Charles, and three peripheral sites, and 2,500 beds and 1,500 doctors in training across their health service. So we've been able, we've signed the contract uh, at the end of last month, 
and we will actually be implemented uh, before Christmas this year. So it's a very rapid process to, to implement and we're really excited at the opportunities up in, up in Queensland. So going into next year, we've actually got eight New South Wales LHDs with 40% of the doctors in training, two Queensland Health Services with about 27%, which means that next year um, this platform will be used to orientate about 680 newly minted doctors. So about 20% of the 2019 junior doctor cohort are going to be introduced to hospitals on the platform, all the way from a base of just one hospital back in 2015. Um, so that's, that's what I've done, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, the sorts of methodologies that we, I've, my, my team and I have tried to use when, when thinking about this, and hopefully this stimulates a bit of thinking. So we haven't just built Resident Guide, that's not our only focus. We also um, built for the ACI an app called Thinksilin, which has been rolled out across the state, and it's a decision support tool for junior doctors. And it was, came from a problem that had been identified that JMOs are unfortunately not managing in an after hours and weekend environment uh, patients' uh, glycemic levels very well. I clearly remember this as an intern when I get called to a patient in an overtime si uh, after hours situation, blood sugar's high and you know, it's 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, I was unsure about insulin and the guidelines. I thought that was something that med regs better deal with. So you give a couple of units of insulin and then say team review and then you walk away. And the reality is with close to 30% of patients in our hospitals uh, with diabetes that we need to be exerting tighter glycemic control in order to get better patient outcomes. So we sat down with the ACI and, oh, sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself a little bit. Um, so I first, I want to just suggest that if you do have an idea or a desire or, you know, I've got a problem and I think an app can solve it, I want to put it to you that are you sure that an app is going to solve the problem? So the average user of a smartphone in a Western country has 90 apps on their phone. They use nine of those apps a day, 13 apps in a week, and apparently 30 apps in a month. I'm not sure how the maths works out there. The question I put to you is, would it be better to use a, a simple website or a responsive website? So there's a recent study at the Alfred Hospital that said that they've got 12,000 databases of patient information inside, inside their hospital. Um, and I, I worked in, um, in finance before I did medicine, and I remember very clearly a lot of the bigger financial institutions have this problem with orphan projects, so someone gets a rush of steam and goes out and they build something and it becomes good for internal usage, then that person who maintains that, that product or that, that platform leaves and eventually it dies. And I've certainly seen that even just during internship as well. People come up with research projects and they get them out and then they leave the health district and then all of a sudden that project falls apart under its own steam. So how can you build something that's sustainable, that People, you know, other people in other districts that are doing it are really like um, Giani that you're putting together a database so that people might be able to, to link together. Uh, and part of, part of my questioning of whether you need to build an app is um, something that was identified in 2013 by the UK's Digital Transformation Office. So they did a review. So basically, uh, UK Gov IT they put together basically a startup unit and they said, we're going to decide the whole government's uh, approach to IT. And they said, we're, we're not going to do any apps. We can't have situations where people are spending between twenty dollars and $200,000 on a platform that where it needs to be constantly updated. We should be supporting open standards, which for them meant responsive HTML5. So you can just build a website and it should be accessible on a mobile phone. Uh, and I'd like to just put that back because you can actually sink a lot of money in developing an app. So between twenty and two hundred thousand dollars would be what probably most development houses would would quote. You can also try and build it yourself or boot, bootstrap, as it's known in the, um, in the in the lingo. That's um, what I did. 
and it's free, but obviously you've got some sweat equity that goes into it and you've got to teach yourself how to code. Um, but you can certainly save a fair bit of actual cash expenditure in that. You can also go down the freelancer route, which might be between two and $20,000, but that comes with a whole bunch of problems around it as well. Uh, in order to manage someone and not go through a development house, you really need to have good, strong project management skills. And it might take between three to 12 months. So I, I'd put those to you just to bear in the back of your mind as you go about thinking about how you, how you might move forward with your, with your projects. So we use a process, if we go back to the, the Think, Think Sealant app and also what we use internally for Resident Guide, we use a process called design thinking. And there's three main steps to design thinking. So you want to, uh, sorry, there's a number of steps to design thinking. But design thinking, this, is this quote here, where essentially it's around trying to focus on the problem from the perspective of a user. So this is the process, and it would probably be called, some people use agile, you might have heard that term throughout um, this workshop, as a way of moving forward. But essentially, you need to understand what the problem is. You do some ideation, some prototyping. You might go back to the first step. You might jump further down and do some user testing. You might try and do a pilot. You might need to be go, go back to prototyping and then go forward. So it's very different from maybe the project management approaches that we might have come across in in school if that was that was probably the last time I started to understand project management until until recently and there's a number of key steps to design thinking so why does it need to be made what's the problem addressing who's going to be the users what are the functions and features that needs to have you step through the user journey so how's the person actually going to be interacting with this platform you make some assumptions and you prototype it and we're able to um, go through this process with the ACI and the focus group that they had, which consisted of diabetes educators and JMOs. And that was not just in their Chatswood offices, but also people video conferencing in. And we're able to build a, a great product that was uh, nominated for a New South Wales Health Award earlier this year. And is, from a, uh, all reports we've had, has been, has been a very successful uh, technology implementation. So I'm going to quickly just run you through the sort of steps that we use. So when we were going through the problem we were addressing, we went around the room and we asked everyone to think about what everyone understood the problem. Most of them were users. Some of them were on the JMO side. Some of them on the diabetes educator side. So what are the steps we need? Um, we put up a bunch of ideas. And then we got everyone to go around and vote for them. So what are the key things? So those little red dots are the, the votes that everyone put in. And we, did, we then ranked them based on those votes and decided that those were the ones that are going to move forward. So the things we decided, we need good and clear decision-making guidelines, it needs to require an evidence base, the sorts of things that you might think are actually given assumptions, but it does help to make sure that everyone in a room is coming up with these ideas together and focusing on the same solution. We then went through our users, so we decided that Yes, there's probably going to be some nursing users, but our core users are really going to be JMOs. So that made it very easy to, from then on, whenever we came up against, okay, what are the, what are the things we're going to include in the app or remove from the app, to decide that this is the, it's a problem that they're going to face, so everything else is out of scope. Then went through our functions and, again, used this sort of dot voting. So what is the app actually going to be used for? It's great that the ACIs decided that we need an app and that we've got a bunch of JMOs who are really keen to put something out, but what are they going to use it for? Is it just going to be sheets of information that's not going to be useful? Or do we, we have clear outcomes that we want to be able to achieve from the app? So we decided effectively that we want to know how to manage hypo and hyperglycemic episodes, frequency of blood glucose uh, monitoring uh, in the context of hypers and hypos, what actions can we take? And that was actually really interesting to try and force the endocrine, statewide endocrine working group to come up with some really clear guidelines in that um, and, and a, a number of other features. We then stepped through a user journey. So we created a user persona. Uh, you know, 50, more than 50% of uh, junior doctors are women. So our user is Jess. She's a 27-year-old JMO. 
She's on her first evening shift and she was called to a patient at 9 o'clock, 68-year-old uh, with uh, blood glucose of 21. And then we thought about the different situations that the app might be used in. So before the app, she might be in a, Jess might be in a situation where she used the past blood sugar levels as a guide. If it was, um, uh, she might just give a, a, a very low supplementary, homeopathic supplementary dose of insulin. I've certainly been guilty of doing that when I was an intern. Uh, and the patient is at risk of poor out-of-hours glycemic control. We wanted a situation where with the app, Jess had very clear guidelines, no ambiguity over the course of action. It was her responsibility. She wasn't going to wait for a med reg to pop in or for the team to review the next morning. And she was going to be able to rely on best practice information. So after the app, uh, after she'd used the app, if there was any issues, she knew how to escalate appropriately. The patient had better glycemic control, which is going to result in better patient outcomes uh, and decreased stress for the JMO. We also had a number of assumptions and risks around it. So we needed to constrain our scope so that it was finite for the endocrine working group to give us some hard data, hard information. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel. So there's lots of other information out there. We just wanted to make sure that it was very clear that what we were doing wasn't, hadn't been done before. We wanted to make sure that if you were using this app across New South Wales, you could follow these recommendations that it was guidelines and not protocol, so taking that awareness of clinical context and making sure that there's a, a human element in there as well. So is this actually appropriate or should I be thinking about something else? And we thought we're never going to be able to build something that's going to capture everything, so let's try and capture 80% of the clinical cases. And with all of that information, we then shifted into prototyping. So at the prototyping stage, we got everyone in the room as well as a bunch of people online to, based on what we thought, to actually draw up some screenshots of the app. And we did a couple of rounds of that. So we've had if about 15 or 20 of us in the room and we got everyone to draw some pictures and then talk us through what their pictures meant. And then we did another round and we had to copy from everyone. So, so everyone's stealing everyone's best practices. And so this is a, some examples of a couple of those. And this is effectively what the app looks like. So there's actually a reasonable amount of similarities to some of the original screenshots, which is pretty interesting. So that's a, the design process that we, that we work for. I'm sure you, there's lots of reading that you can do on the internet around design thinking that hopefully will be very stimulating for you. I think it's a fantastic methodology. Um, I'm just going, we've only got a few minutes left, so I'm going to step you through a few other <laughs> things that I've learned. So a couple of things that I've told you um, during this session, they're my beliefs. Your mileage may vary. When I first set out on this journey, I had people giving me advice all the time. Some people were very adamant in their advice. The only thing I learned was that you shouldn't actually really... You can listen to everyone, but you should always follow your own judgment. Um, you know, no one has all the answers, and it's best to be consultative and you know, talk to as many people as you can, but don't take anything as dogma. So while there might not be any right ways to do things, there are a few wrong ways. So don't alienate e-health or your local health district. Do not uh, make sure that you treat privacy seriously. Uh, don't get into the mistake of solving a problem that isn't a real problem. And lots of people will offer you advice and tell you what to do. So, you know, choose, choose wisely when, on who you want to listen to. Also think about the end game. So I, when I was all the way through med school and internship, I really, really wanted to do surgery. And I sat at the primaries and, as a resident and was all geared up to um, have a go at, you know, basically settle into registrar life. And now I basically created a monster and um, running an eight-person team, and this takes up most of my time. So have a thought about what is actually really important to you. I've made the determination all the way through that medicine is really important to me, and I'm trying to work out how to get back to doing more of it. Uh, but do have a think um, if... 
things start to go well, who's going to be managing the tool that you create? Will you leave your job for it? Will you run it forever? Will you try and sell it? And if you do sell it, what would happen to your idea? Do you care about it enough that you want to make it sure that it's retained in its form? Or are, is some big corporate entity going to obliterate it and make, take all the fun out of it? Uh, and a few tips. Things will take twice as long and cost twice as much, at least. Don't create orphan projects, so things that will die when you move or if you were to win the lottery, as, as we say. Don't reinvent the wheel. There's lots and lots of things happening at so many LHDs. It, it can be very difficult to find those projects, but whether it be in New South Wales or Australia-wide, we have such a small technology workforce that we can't actually support multiple projects that are doing the same thing. Where we see similarities, we should 100% be trying to collaborate. That's not for our own benefit, but it's for the people that we're trying to help, which is patients. So if we're all trying to stand up individual things, it's going to fall over. We must collaborate. And, um, and having partners helps as well. Uh, so that's me. How, how badly over time did I go? Are there any questions? Thank you to everyone online. If you have any questions, please send them through. Yep, sure. Rob, we have two questions that have come through online. The first one is from a colleague from one of the LHDs. They're wondering whether you have capacity to collaborate with some of the other LHDs that are interested. Yeah, absolutely. We're always looking to have as many conversations as possible. Uh, all of our the, our current LHDs that we've got in, we try very hard to make sure that where we're going next and where we're coming from, that we're collaborating. We try and propagate best practice between the sites that we're in. We absolutely love, um, and yeah, we've got the capacity, and if we don't have the capacity, we'll get the capacity. Fantastic. So the best way for them to get in touch is just to contact you directly? Yes, that, yep, that'd be great. Fantastic. And the other question came from one of our colleagues online about your um, development and implementation process. Have you published anything academically about that or do you plan to? We've always got plans to try and get um, published things. Uh, it's definitely been a capacity issue for us to be able to get that sort of stuff out, but we're hoping to put, put out some details on what's involved with our process, what a hospital can expect um, next year. So during We've got actually a consultant engaged in all of our implementations during the internship process next year. We'll be having very strong engagement with them all and trying to get some really good data on what the hospitals are experiencing, what the junior doctors are experiencing, and, and feed that to everyone. Fantastic. Thank you. Were there any questions in the room? I'll just bring the microphone over to you. Thank you. Um, how are you managing intellectual property, uh, intellectual um, property rights? How are you managing the Do you mean um, the actual app um, it, itself, so the code to the app? Uh, so we, I don't believe in software patents. I think that it's an absolute waste of time. Uh, anyone, if I had built something really clever, like something some analytical engine that was able to take a whole bunch of patient data and had a proprietary algorithm, I'd probably have a different point of view. But this is, it w certainly was originally very simple software. It's now got a number of features that would hopefully be harder for someone to take away. And a lot of that is actually the, the IP that we have built internally around how to engage a hospital, how to support not just the medical admin, medical workforce, but also the JMOs in terms of collecting the right sort of content and making sure that people are engaged with it. But my point of view is that dealing, thinking and worrying about IP is an absolute waste of time. Um, if someone can do what I'm doing better than me, then I don't deserve to be doing it. Ooh. Were there any other questions uh, from the audience here? Yep, one down the front. Getting my steps up today. Thank you so much, Rob. That was so interesting. Um, I'm just wondering, with the app, are there ways or um, have you been able to evaluate which aspects of the information you're providing are the most useful? So which part, kind of, I guess, is the most? Yes, we've got um, 
So we collect usage data. We anonymize all of our usage data. So we know, you know, hospital, we don't know the user who's done it because we do have that wellbeing information that might be, you know, suicide support or something like that. And we never want to be put in a position where a hospital comes to us and says, who's been accessing that? Because we think that that is the wrong sort of approach. But we absolutely feed back to our hospitals metrics on what people are finding useful, what people are engaging with. And we also go one step further in terms of we try and cross-pollinate information between LHDs. So, for example, uh, Hunter New England, which is our, our largest LHD, um, or the largest LHD, but also our largest LHD, uh, we, they have got some great information on how to write good death certificates. And what we were able to do with their permission is we saw that St George didn't have that information and we were able to cross-pollinate that information Similarly, we've, we've done the same sort of thing with pharmacy information, how to write your yeah, outpatient scripts, S4s, S8s. So we're using that data to actually try and lift up all of our LHDs and provide that sort of networking. Thank you, thank you very much. Any other questions from the room? One here. Yeah. Hi, Rob. Um, I was just wondering how easy or difficult was it to get your first pilot up and going? Uh, so it was a bit of an accident, really. So. I I'd built a couple of things before this during internship, like task managers and things that I was using for myself just because I, I was living on the central coast and I grew up in the country. I don't know how to surf, so I was, <laughs> didn't, didn't have a fair bit of free time. Um, and so the ones with patient information, I'd been dealing with North Sydney Central Coast ICT to see how I might be able to get them to plug in. Obviously, as someone who's working, you know, pretty solid working week as an intern and then you don't have the capability to support the privacy and the security aspects that they wanted. So I ended up changing focus. And the problem that I'd talked to you about had been really grating me. So I started building a framework that I was originally just going to provide for us internally for our RMOA and just start to put all our information on and then have it. But I had a chance meeting with a resident from Wagga who'd put together a set of content called the Resident Guide. And they'd been able to put it up on a website. The issue being that having it up on a website meant that it wasn't offline first. And as we all know, most hospitals don't have the greatest reception. And um, so they came to me. They'd been looking around for quotes and getting those sorts of $50,000 figures that I showed you earlier. Um, we ran into each other at a conference. He knew that I'd been doing a bit of work around apps. They had, I think, one or $2,000 of DPET funding. And I said, yep, great, let's go. Um, and I uh, changed what I'd already sort of been scoping to put all of their content on, and then we went live in January. So it was, uh, you know, a couple of chance meetings and a few accidents, and then uh, later that year, Orange Hospital had a Shark Tank-like pitch event, and a, a resident there actually said, look, if, if I get some money, can you make it so that sort of two sites come on? And she, was able, she basically just ran it through and was able to get some funding. And then we were at two sites all of a sudden. So things have sort of snowballed since then, obviously. And, um, but it was a, really a couple of chance encounters. So it was, I'm here by accident. Well done. Great. Thanks, Rob. It sounds like it was meant to be with all of those coincidences. Um, so the next session, we're going to be talking about some research considerations. Um, first up, the first half of the session is going to be two speakers from CSIRO, so I'd like to introduce them. Um, we have David, Dr. David Silvera Tawil, who's a research scientist at CSIRO's Australian eHealth e Research Centre. He's a mechan mechanotronics researcher working in the fields of digital health, human computer interaction, human robot interaction. His ongoing work focuses on the design, delivery, implementation, and evaluation of digital health services. I'd also in, like to introduce Dr. Sazad Hussain. He's also a research scientist with the Australian eHealth Research Centre in CSIRO. He is a human computer interaction researcher working in the fields of digital health, effective computing and learning technologies. Sazad has a PhD in computer science from the University of Sydney. Welcome. Um, I'm David. So I'll I'll start with the first part of the presentation, and Sasad will jump in halfway through. Just trying to figure this out. So, 
So um, before starting, uh, who are we and what do we have to, to offer here? So we're, um, as Gianni said, part of the Australian Health Research Center. Uh, it's the largest digital health research center in Australia. Uh, we're about 100 staff and PhD students. And the, the, the whole center is mainly divided in, in, in three bigger groups, uh, biomedical informatics, uh, that it looks mainly at genomics, biostatistics, and imaging and how to develop technology to, to work with biomedical data, uh, health informatics and health analytics, that looking at improving health system from electronic health data and doing prediction in uh, electronic medical records, uh, hospital data, etc., and health services that is looking at improving access to services management and chronic diseases, and that's the group we both belong to. So we're looking at a little bit more how to use technology to enhance consumer awareness and participation in their own health. And some of the solutions we, we work with include Internet of Things, mobile health, uh, chatbots, wearables, robots, um, a lot of different sensors. Mobile health includes, of course, apps. And that's what we're talking about today. Uh, rural and, web and remote digital care is telehealth, telemedicine stuff. And we work from Sorry, we work from implementation, evaluation, consulting, uh, partnerships with universities, hospitals, etc. So we do a, a, a lot of different range of, of things. Um, our focus is really you know, clinically validated uh, technology, uh, user centric. We put the user in the center and make sure that the technology we develop works for, for, for people who are going to be using it. And uh, we create digital. Uh, service delivery, so basically technology to, to improve services. So jumping straight into the research considerations. Um, there'll be a little bit of overlapping what Rob was, what was talking about before, uh, because we, we all work very similarly. Um, I'll start with, with a general overview on, on what we consider when we're talking about research. This is not a recipe. This is just some of the points in 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 an order that they're normally followed, but some of the blocks can be removed or changed order depending on the on the actual uh, app. Uh, but you know, th this is more or less uh, how we think about. Uh, we start with an idea. Um, you know, the first thing is you have a great idea. Let's confirm that it's a great idea. You know, do a little bit of market research, literature review, make sure that. Uh, nobody has already done the app that you, you're thinking about doing that you know, it, it, it seems to be helpful for others. Just try to have a little bit more of a thing. Don't jump straight into developing an app without you know, considering what's out there and what's already been done. Uh, once you find the gaps and you confirm, yeah, you know, it's, it, it's a good idea and I think we should develop it. Um, not talk with expert partners, users, that's what robots talking about you know, the design thinking, if you can, in a formal or informal world, put, put people in, in the room and start thinking about you know, who are the users, what is the problem, are we actually fixing a problem, uh, how do we visualize this, this project, and this could be as simple as you know, just quick conversations or a full day of, of research thinking and come with, with an idea. Um, we normally, after we, we, we do that uh, research thinking, because we're doing this as a research project, and, and taking everything into consideration, we we go through through ethics. Uh, we make sure that you know, we, we will if we will start approaching people that are not involved in the project, uh, we go we follow the, the right ethics procedures and, and and we treat the data as research data. And we go to what we normally call it a, a user needs analysis, talking with with the actual users we identified and and try to see that what we defined in our um, in our, our first process is what they actually want, what they actually going to do, what they actually expect. Uh, basically, we try to look at the requirements of that app. Uh, we have a, a vision in our head, but would that vision actually work with you, uh, with the actual users, or do we have to make any modifications? And that's where we, we start uh, thinking about how the app is going to, to look really, and, and what is the problem we're actually thinking about solving. Um, this 
three boxes, you can see we have visibility and refinement. And that's a little bit of a, of a general loop where we go and we start planning what's the evaluation framework that we're, we're going to run at the end. Uh, because we want to solve a problem, we have a hypothesis. How are we going to test our hypothesis at the end of, of this process? And at the same time, we start designing our technology. Uh, you know, we could have some pilot studies, and we re redefine our evaluation. And at some point, once we, we really know what we're doing, you know, we have a very good idea of how we're evaluating it, we jump into the development. And at that stage, we might still go back and refine a few things. Uh, so we, we stay in this loop a few times until we have an MVP or a minimal viable product. This is not necessarily a commercial product, but it's a product, it's an app that is ready to go out there to be evaluated, to be used by people. And um, it might be very close to the, to the final product, uh, but after the evaluation, we will go back to this, to this process and, and say, yeah, this worked, this didn't work, this was used, this wasn't used. We can modify it, and then we go to we create a, a, a commercial product. Um, here, from the MVP, we have a, a final study design. We run the study, we run the evaluation, we analyze our data, and as I said, we might go back to the development and adjust the product a little bit. So that's in general how we do things. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about a case study, and as I will talk about a different one. You'll see that they're both very different uh, uh, products, and we did a few different things, but we'll give you a little bit of an idea. The first one is Caldasit. So Caldasit is an app we developed to, to facilitate communication between uh, staff, uh, allied health staff and nursing staff, and patients from non-English speaking backgrounds, so called patients. Uh, culturally and linguistically diverse patients when interpreters are not available. So it's not to replace interpreters, but interpreters are not always available. And when they're not available, sometimes we still need to communicate with the patients. Uh, for those cases, we have called assist until an inter interpreter is available. So that's the idea of this one and was developed in collaboration with, uh, with Western Health. Um, so. Sorry, this is the, the, the main screen, the first screen. You know, we have it in 10 languages. We included English now as an 11 language as well. You choose your language and you have a, it's a very simple uh, screen with phrases on the left. Uh, you choose your phrase, they're divided by different dis uh, dis disciplines. In this case, it's occupational therapy. And they also divided by sections. And there's different sections for each discipline depending on their requirements. You have the phrase, uh, you have the translated phrase, you have the language on the top. Um, we have images, could be multiple images, could be videos, uh, depending on what the phrase is saying. And we have audio of the phrase in, in the language and answer options or follow-up questions. For example, have you lost weight in the last six months? They can say yes or no, but even the answer might be difficult to understand, so they can point to the yes or the no. A following up question, how much weight have you lost? And, and, and that's, that, that's the general idea. Um, how did we start with this project? It started with an idea from a speech pathologist in, in Western Health who said, uh, patients with uh, swallowing problems were, are at risk of dehydration if we are not able to complete assessment when they come. Uh, patients would come, there's no in, uh, interpreter, they need to be sent home and come the next day with an interpreter. So I decided, how big is the problem? Well, just in uh, in, in Brigham, when, where Western Health is, about 20% of patients don't speak any English. So it was a big problem. Um, after doing some market analysis literature review, basically trying to find a map that, that would solve their problem, there was nothing available. And yes, it is a big problem to have uh, issues in communication with, with health patients. Um, so let's start piloting. Let's start. After doing design thinking and saying how will we we approach this, uh, there was an idea of let's have uh, some phrases that are interpreted to the most common languages with images and we can communicate with that. Let's pilot it and see if it works. Um, easier way to pilot it: paper, flip chart. There's no need to do any development. Uh, have the most common phrases, and let's do an evaluation. Uh, in this case, was a few months evaluation, 
just-in-speech pathology, and assessment completion rates actually increased from 30% 30, 30 to 80%. So you know, a lot of patients who came and couldn't communicate were actually able to have a full assessment just because we had this flip chart. Once we were able to test this, the next step was let's do this digital and then take it to more, more, more areas. So that's when we started doing an user needs. How would this look in in an app? How would this translate from speech pathology to uh, different allied health groups to nursing? Uh, how can we make this grow? And we run a number of, of focus groups, a number of interviews, observation sessions. Uh, it was really treated as two different projects, allied health and nursing, just because for allied health, we realized that their their main interest was in assessment. For nursing, the main interest was everyday interactions. Interactions were one minute long, 30, minute, 30 seconds long. And for allied health, was a few minutes long. It, it was a very different process. So we needed to evaluate two different things. We split it in two projects. It's the same app, but with different things organized, different things that were evaluated. Um, after the user needs, we had our list of requirements and list of uh, design uh, concepts. Uh, main parts that the clinic uh, staff was interested in was you know, it needs to be integrated into our practice. It needs to provide uh, um, value, equity of service, accessibility to everyone, to users, to patients, to staff easy to use, and it needs to be accurate. Um, which, I didn't say that, but that's why we also included, uh, got involved with the languages, uh, with interpreting and cultural services, to make sure that they could help us, to make sure that uh, the way they use and they interpret phrases was the same way we, we interpret our phrases. So they actually took char charge of that for, for, for us. They helped us to, to get everything accurate. Evaluation, again, we had two evaluations. Uh, once we had the, the app developed and, and the evaluation framework, this is how, how we evaluated. Uh, two different uh, evaluations, one for allied health, one for nursing. Um, we used mixed methods and comparative methods before and after. So we started with a baseline without an app. Then we did a live trial with an app, the same thing in both cases. Um, for the first one, Allied Health, as I said, was mainly focused on assessment. On the other case, was in, in nursing, was focused on, sh on shorter interaction. Um, one thing we found, we realized was challenging at the beginning uh, with, with Allied Health was the patient interviews. The app was designed to be used when interpreters were not available. Um, getting questionnaires from, from patients was very difficult if interpreters was, were not available. But if the interpreters were available, we were not able to use the app because for, for, for legal reasons and for, for health reasons, we, were, we, we had to use the interpreter. Uh, so instead of getting the questionnaires answered when the app was used, we had to wait until the interpreter came. And we realized that most of the patients didn't even remember using the app. It was helpful. We finished the, the, the assessment but they didn't remember using the app, which is positive, because it means the experience didn't change. But we didn't get as, as many questions as we want. With um, nursing, was a lot easier because interactions are, the patients were there using the app quite a lot. So we were able to get quite a few, a few interviews and, and gather a lot of more data. We did also hours of observation. So we, we learned quite a lot from that. Um, outcomes. Uh, that we looked at, uh, it was basically acceptability and satisfaction of the app, success of the interactions, confidence of the interactions, staff frustration, number and length of interactions, both in, with nurses and assessment, comparison between uh, cult patients and English-speaking patients. Uh, we looked at how the interactions changed with and without the app. Uh, in overall, you know, not showing any any detailed results here. There's papers to, to read if you're interested in looking at that. But overall, we, we, we noticed that the app was successful. The hypothesis that an app would help patients was, was very, and, and staff was very, very positive. And as I will talk about the next one. Uh, thank you for having me here today. I'm going to talk about the next case study, which is called Activate TKR. 
So Activate T-Care is an innovative digital platform for total knee replacement care, and it supports patients in uh, preparation for surgery as well as recovery. The platform consists of a mobile app, uh, wearable activity tracker, and a clinical web portal. And the aim is to engage patients with information, physiotherapy exercise, as well as motivate them to complete rehabilitation. The second aim is also to bridge the gap between clinicians and patients. This is a project uh, with a commercial partner, Johnson & Johnson Medical Devices. So just to give you an overview of the platform first, we have a patient-facing app which delivers a tailored physiotherapy program. It integrates with the wearable device. It collects daily steps, stairs, hours slept. It also collects self-reported pain and range of motion. It has uh, contents that are called support tools that are in the form of weekly contents that are practical information, reminders, and as well as there's mentoring and some coaching that is related to the journey of their TKR. There's also options to um, report that the patients have been recovering and they're achieving functional activities after surgery. The clinical web portal provides uh, at a glance dashboard of list of patients and uh, how they are doing and it is showing uh, if any of them would require attention. And going into individual patients, the clinician, whether it's a surgeon or a physiotherapist, can look at the data that's been collected from the patient um, when they are achieving functional mo mobility. And this is also where a physiotherapist can uh, tailor and assign physiotherapy programs from a demonstration videos, and that gets pushed to the app. So in this case, we had to do a user need study uh, similar to the other case study. Uh, and the user need study informed the design and functionalities of the platform. We ran mixture of interviews and focus groups with TKR patients. Uh, GPs, orthopedic surgeons, and physiotherapists. And we try to capture, uh, from a multi-stakeholder perspective, the journey of TKR and the opportunities for solutions in the rehabilitation for TKR. And we saw that uh, there was different stages in the journey, and each had different needs and priorities. And it informed us about the design of the platform. We looked at following that around priorities for the technology solution, where it looked at into the value for the user by considering their demographic. Also, understanding if they were ready to uh, adopt technology. We looked at healthcare delivery models, such as the private and uh, pr um, public healthcare system. But at the same time, we wanted to have something that we can develop. So we looked at off-the-shelf technology that we can use for uh, De developing the platform. And we also use the study in order to do refinements of the features and the functionalities. And taking that forward, we went on to the design phase. So this is just a sample example of wireframes. And with the app and the portal, as you can see, it structurally it shows very much similarity with the actual system. But it's a skeleton of the features and the functions. This is also followed by uh, visual designs. So at this stage, it allows the different stakeholders and the partners to kind of uh, make refinements and changes before even going into the app development. And the final product would be something that would need or require less changes. So in terms of running a study, um, we, 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 are, we, we looked into the literature to understand uh, what would be the right study for this? We decided to do a multi-site randomized control trial, and we estimated 150 TKR patients would be suitable, divided to control intervention. We looked at uh, mainly a quantitative component uh, to evaluate clinical efficacy, uh, satisfaction, acceptance, uh, behavioral factors, as well as economic impact. So we wanted to include different types of outcome measures and see how the platform would perform. There's also a qualitative component with patients, carers, and clinicians, 
and that's to capture the perceived value of a technology solution such as this. So the study design um, here just gives an overview where you can see that there's an intervention period of 16 weeks. So the app is used by patients around four weeks before surgery and 12 weeks after. Then they go on to live for 40, 40 weeks as a free living. It's uh, randomized by the trial site. And we have four main time points where the, the outcome measures are collected. So four weeks before surgery, which is the baseline, then uh, just a few days before surgery, 12 weeks after, and then week 52. So I just want to conclude by giving like three tips, and it's based on our experience, and it goes very much in line with Rob, what Rob has mentioned. And uh, the three things that we think are important are to consult, plan, and evaluate. So consult, uh, just when there's a concept, an idea, is good to discuss with uh, domain experts and as well as technology experts. So domain experts could be clinicians that are within your reach, or it could be university collaborators, and technology-wise, it could be, uh, for example, the CSIRO. And doing a bit of uh, market research, and, and it's mostly desk research, looking at if anyone else has done the work previously, testing the water, and really thinking about, uh, does this solution work for others? Like It might be a great solution, but is it really going to have an impact? And we, we say fail fast and move on. Uh, it's always good to have an idea, and then if we think that we've done a bit of research and we th don't think that's feasible, it's always good to move on uh, and have a new idea. But if the, if the plan does go on and the idea is good, then it's good to think about recruitment, because in terms of uh, who are the users that are going to help you gather a requirement, but also to do the evaluation study. And there's involvement of time and cost that will impact on that planning. So development, who's going to actually develop the technology platform? Like, is there someone within the organization that can do it? Are you going to learn coding and then you're going to write the software? So that needs to be considered. And hosting, so whether it's running the trial or even sustaining the product eventually as a service, it's important to think about where it's going to sit. Is it going to be in the App Store? Is it going to be run by a third-party company? Or is it the hospital that's going to sustain it and, and, and service will stay with them? Lastly, uh, evaluate the concept, the technology, and your claims. And try different methods. The methods could be very different for different applications and different um, um, concepts. Uh, there could be qualitative studies, it could be a mix of surveys, as well as not necessarily always a clinical study, but that might also be uh, a pathway to go. Thank you. Thanks, Asad and David. And we've just got some questions now. All right. Thank you both very much for that uh, presentation. Um, really good points there. And, uh, we talk in South East Sydney about failing small and failing fast, so that that bit of advice aligns to uh, how the advice we give. So I've had a few people text me through some questions. Everyone's getting creative. Um, somehow they found my personal number. So the first uh, first question that's come through, uh, David, you talked about the digital health design process. Um, can you do the same process with a website or mobile web page? Yes. Uh, it, 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 when we do the design, um, the, the same process can be used for any technology. If it's an app, if it's a website, if it's a wearable, if it's a robot. Uh, it's the, the process on how we look at the technology, at the problem, how we're going to uh, solve what the problem is, how we involve the users. Um, it's a similar process, it's just a different approach. So, yes. And the other question was around called assist. Um, how can people and who, who can access? Uh, uh, called assist is in the App Store. Uh, if I'm correct, it's only available for tablets or iPads, not for mobile phones, I think. Uh, but yeah, just look for called assist in the App Store and it's free. Was there any questions in the room? We might take okay, time. Right here, the time. Oh, 
<laughs> really, really interesting. Um, just a question. You were just saying that the Carl, the Carl de Sister app is available in the App Store. So I'm just wondering, for the general person in the street who might want to use that particular app, how do they find out? You know, is there, like, do you market the apps afterwards or how, how do you disseminate the information because it's great to have the app available, but... It, it really it really depends on on, on the case uh, and, and every app would be different uh, this particular app because well it was we, we worked together with Western health Western health is the one that is doing most of the marketing for for, for that app but yes yeah the, the idea is that the app will you know, hopefully other many hospitals will, will pay and, and use the apps um, but it's, it's case by case Sometimes we do the marketing for the app. Um, RCT trial is that um, online? Um, that so up? the RCT trial, there is a paper published for the RCT as well as the user needs, okay. but it's ongoing trial. So uh, we're still waiting for results. Thank you so much, David. So now we just have two other speakers who have kindly joined us from UTS. Um, we have Dr. Joanne, sorry, Dr. Travalia. Joanne Travalia, who is the Director of the Centre of Health Services Management and Associate Dean of Research, Innovation and Impact for the Faculty of Health Science at UTS. Joanne is a medical sociologist with a particular interest in the quality and safety of care for vulnerable groups. A former employee of South East Sydney, and she maintains strong ties with the district. And we also have Deb, who is going to introduce herself. Um, Deb and I have been thinking about not so much technology but more about vulnerable groups um, but we were keen to talk to you today because we were asked to talk on the social perspectives on app development and technology and data is thoroughly and completely embedded in the social context and so it has implications if we think about the societal um, as to what you're designing and what the outcomes are. And I think the previous speakers have shown that very clearly. So there's an old saying that says, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago, and the second best time to plant a tree is now. And I've got to say the same is true both for planning for equity and designing the evaluation of apps. Um, maybe not 20 years ago when we didn't have apps, but any time before you start. So thinking about the social dimensions of the app, who you're targeting, what the focus is, who's going to be included, who's not, um, it's better done before the design happens. Human beings are informational and sense-making creatures, which I think comes as no surprise to any of you. But we collect, process and theorise about our natural and man-made, human-made environments and have always done so. Um, we've got examples from Neolithic technologies that included people doing harvest estimations and calculations, numeracy and writing in conjunctions with visual abstractions and maps of their territory. Various analogue informational systems characterise recorded histories, libraries, card index, system censuses. We're always trying to find new ways of capturing information and transmitting that information. And we've had various informational systems and leaps, um, and we see things different ways. And one of the one of the interesting things is when you you hear how the brain is described. So as each technology came through society, and people started you know, looking at things like clocks. People would say the brain's like a clock, or then the brain brain's like a computer, or the brain's like a whatever it is that we, we've we're working on next. So there's that process of how do we make sense of the world and how do we collect the data that we're observing? Technology, though, has a problematic social history. The processing and categorising and quantifying of the social domain gained a lot of momentum in the 18th century um, and certainly gained a lot more momentum after Darwin. Social categorisation and quantification developed in a moralising Victorian environment 
So the process of data collection is not only about finding the norm, but about normalising, so deciding what's acceptable within a society. Data made this possible and informed and continues to inform social regulation with the major purpose was the surveillance of moral subjects. So we're talking about this because technology has implications that are far beyond um, what we might think about. And so, for example, um, the police force at Renfin is using algorithms um, to predict who might be more likely to commit a crime. And hardly surprising, most of those people are Indigenous, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, because that's what the algorithm comes up with. And the algorithm is based on the data that's provided, but the data is not questioned in terms of, some of you will be listening to the news this week, um, the fact that Indigenous people end up in jail much more often than non-Indigenous people, and a lot of that's about the types of crimes and how crime is seen. Um, and so there's a whole dimension of social within the information that we have and the information that we're capturing and how it's being used. Exclusion is often as damaging as inclusion and when we're looking at um, social information. So being included, as I said, with Indigenous people and, and looking at algorithms um, for criminality is damaging, but being excluded is damaging. Um, there's a recent few years ago paper in Nature that basically talked about how women are systematically excluded from a lot of medical research. Um, and my favourite one was they found that there was, there was research being done on menopause that excluded women. And you think, okay, and it's biological research. It wasn't about the implications on families. Um, and there's a fabulous book called Even the Lab Rats Were White about um, the, uh, the skew in terms of ethnicity. So the data that we're basing our apps are on are really interesting. Social sciences are implicating the consequences of data use and misuse, and there's a concern with statistical and mathematical rules that bolster the science of small data and its application in practice, and at form of knowledge, abstraction and contrast, quant over qual, objectivity over subjectivity, the kind of um, information that's being transmitted has to be looked at as well. Um, data analysis often disconnects from social outcomes, one of the risks of the parabolic rise of algorithms used in mechanisms of social control, so this is predictive policing that I've just talked about. Um, and, um, and it can be magnified by the big data technology paradigm. So emergent, digital, high, positive, totalising, transactional and unfinished. We don't know what the implications of a lot of our new technology are. We have some ideas, but we don't necessarily know. But history would predict that it has an uneven impact on people. Some people will be harmed. Some people will be helped. How that occurs is something that we need to think about, particularly if we're going to use technology in healthcare. Um, Genevieve Bell, who is an Australian um, anthropologist who spent most of her time working in Silicon Valley, has this wonderful saying, any form of technology has a world view embedded in it. And for me, it's summed up by this wonderful picture by an artist, Mark Bryan, of the Mona Lisa within what would be a 1950s futuristic landscape. So it may the technology is shining in you, but what's the world view? I think that's something that we have to keep asking ourselves in terms of particularly health technology and apps. What's the world view that's embedded in whatever technology that we're looking at? If we're thinking about research around technology or evaluation, um, Devan talks about the Vs, the volume, the velocity, the variety, the variability, the veracity, the visualisation and the value and they're important, but also um, the quantities and variety of data are beyond previous experiences, but so are the social implications of, of both of these. What are the implications of the technology for use and misuse and abuse? What are new risks and possibilities? There's a generational change in methods, concepts and approaches, and we're in a time of epistemic transition. 
how knowledge is created, how it's transmitted, and what we do with it is changing rapidly. And we need to think about those elements as well as the technology that's involved. So let's think about this statement that's made in a, a very nice paper um, on um, mHealth or an apps. mHealth applications or apps, as they are more commonly known, offer the opportunity to improve healthcare delivery and clinical outcomes. The ability to monitor patients remotely can enable patient risk factor management and improve treatment compliance, thus allowing early detection of medical complications and ultimately preventing unnecessary hospitalisation. And you'd say that is a very valorising perspective in terms of APT. There's no issues identified, no, no concerns, no risks. It's all about how wonderful it could be. But one is goes on, it really interests me. In addition to enhance, enhancing the delivery of care, one of the most significant opportunities that mHealth offers is in the consumer health domain, allowing patients to actively engage in and self-manage their condition. Which is true. All of this is potentially true. But there's also potential risks. What happens for those people who can't manage their health or who are not computer literate or who don't have access to the resources? What do we do with them as more and more of this, um, more and more we take up new technology? What happens to the people who, leave, who are left further and further behind? So some of the elements for assessing apps, if we're thinking about the evaluation and research, is comprehensibility. So how can people understand it? Um, presentation. What does what does the presentation look like? But also for different people with visual impairments, for example. Usability. Again, what happens for people with disabilities? And general characteristics. And even though there are sort of three or four very basic dimensions, you can start to think, if you start thinking about it, people who are elderly, and Deb will talk a little bit more about this, people with disabilities, people with lower literacy, what these things mean will differ markedly. And, and the point is to think about where your um, technology is being aimed and who will be excluded and what alternatives are possible. Um, this is... Um, not very nice map from, uh, on users enter design process. And the reason I like it is because it starts in terms of concept generation through ethnography, ethnography through observation. And one of my favourite ideas comes from geography. Um, Hamish Robertson, who, who's one of our colleagues, is a medical geographer, and he talks about in, um, a university in New Zealand that was building a new uh, building and they had to lay a path. And they rang the um, geography department and said, where, where should we put the path? And the geography department said, don't ask us. Wait three months and see where people walk. And there's actually a geographic term for that, which is called desire lines. And I like to think about what are the desire lines that you're building your apps on or your technology on? What's the actual human behaviour? Not what people say, not what you think they want, but what do they actually do? What desires are they are they indicating from what they do? So there's lots of these papers on user-centred design, lots of papers um, indicating the different steps you might need to do to develop um, whatever form of technology you want, and they tend to go round and round. Um, and my and Deb's um, um, message today is really you need to start looking at demography and diversity very early on. The methods for testing usability are not terribly sophisticated. In this one, it's basically concurrent thinking allowed is used to understand participants' thoughts as they interact with the product. Retrospective thinking allowed, asking participants to retrace their steps. Concurrent probing, so probing people as they work on tasks, and retrospective probing, um, working until the session is complete and then asking questions. So when we were asked to talk about research in this area, it's, it's nascent. It's developing just as the technology is developing. But there are some guidelines and some indicators. Um, we need to think about the ethics of big data and technology, particularly for health. Seeing big data and its attendant technologies in the historical context beyond the utopian dystopian cycle and into the real um, implications. Critical, taking a critical position on the social applications of big data in every domain is required. 
including the implications of who's included and who's excluded from any form of technology. Um, an overt informed ethical position on big data tools, their design and their consequences is needing, particularly in healthcare, and a social science perspective to inquire on the social implications of big data and technologies as, as the field develops. Um, an understanding that methods influence understanding. Technology is never neutral. Bell's preemptive question, what the world what is the worldview contained in the technology? should lead us in every form of technology that we develop for health. Uh, Isaac Asimov said, one of the saddest aspects of life now is that science gathers knowledge faster than society has. So, if we believe that premise that technologies have and are invested with social influence, authority and power, then we have a responsibility not only to do no harm, but to let no harm be done as we develop new technologies and implement them, including apps. And what that means is that we need to think, as Joe said, about who's going to be left out and who could potentially be harmed um, with the development and the implementation of technologies. Who might be marginalised even further? Who are vulnerable? So when we look at vulnerability, it's been called the elephant in the room of healthcare. And little and I'll define it as susceptibility to any kind of harm, whether physical, moral or spiritual, at the hands of an agent or agency. Harm can entail both action, but it can also entail inaction. One of the things that uh, Joe Hamish, and I have been looking at is understanding vulnerability not as a single static state, but as a fluid and intersectional state. So you may, or a person may, at any point come in and out of different forms of vulnerability. They may have biological or genetic vulnerabilities. They may have professional vulnerabilities, team vulnerabilities. They may have an intersection of all of these different types of vulnerabilities. And the impact of those vulnerabilities are cascading. So if you have one vulnerability and then you have another on top of that, and then you have another on top of that, then it's cumulative. So Joe did a study with some colleagues and they looked, they interviewed um, and did focus groups with uh, people who work in the healthcare system to find out who they thought were the most vulnerable people in the healthcare system. And not surprisingly, from what we heard earlier, clinicians perceive that they are vulnerable. Patients with high acuity and complex system dependence are vulnerable. Children and youth, people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, the homeless, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So those are the people who traditionally we know are vulnerable. And if we look at the inquiries, we're just about to have one into aged care down over kind of centuries, it's the young, the children, women, elderly and people with disability are represented repeatedly in inquiries into um, patient safety issues. So, does that mean that we're finished? Maybe that just finished me. <laughs> okay, so as I've just said, to, um, said, people are faced with multiple vulnerabilities. So, we've got a history of systemic mistreatment by healthcare providers. Um, you're more likely to have poor quality of care and a rotating door effect. And I've got all those listed on the on the sheet there, but I'm just thinking, when we think about technology design, we need to consider what sort of vulnerabilities people come with, what have their experiences been. So, for example, if you're designing an app or technology um, and people that are involved have a long-embodied history of being discriminated against 
or having data collected that then is used to institutionalise their children, that kind of technology is not going to be, the uptake's not going to be the same as for another socio-demographic group. Does that mean then that, that the implementation of that technology, by very nature of what I've just described, marginalises people further? Um, <laughs> I'm obviously not technology savvy. So just to finish up, I just think we need to just think about the different forms of vulnerability. So we, we've talked about, you know, um, groups of people that are that are vulnerable. But if we break it down and think, what are the different forms of vulnerability? So Joe talked about the epistemic vulnerability. What? How do we know? And, and what evidence do we have? Where does it come from? Um, it tends to come from the lab, the lab rats that wear white coats. Um, there's a famous paper that's called. Um, that's about most of the data comes from psychology students in in America, so that's what we're kind of basing our um, kind of our evidence on. Is it symbolic? How are people referred to? Do we refer to people? Uh, I know in healthcare as bed blockers. Um, are they lazy? Are they from that you know baby boomer generation? I mean, what does that? What kind of a message does that carry? And how does that make people vulnerable? Is it situational vulnerability? Uh, are they in a situation of domestic violence? Are they homeless? Are they from cultural and linguistically diverse backgrounds? Um, and social vulnerability, what is their current situation right now? What are their social kind of structures and strengths? All of those forms of vulnerability don't happen in isolation. They can intersect and people can experience all of them at the same time. Which then just so when we're thinking about vulnerability, it's really important, particularly in relation to design of technology, to not just go, we've captured that they're vulnerable, we've captured it, we can fix it, um, you know, we've taken that into account, but to to remember that people move in and out of different kind of forms of vulnerability. I might finish there as I think. Okay. Yeah. Just give them. Kevin, do you want to stay up for some question? Um, Dan, are there any? Hi, one question online. Thank you, Deb and Joe. Very informative, and I learned a whole bunch of new words. So I've written down a list of learnings. Yes, for me to go away and um, do some research myself. But lots of um, comments coming through uh, from our live streamers um, about how informative that was and how they never really considered aspects such as vulnerability in, in development and design. People are interested, how do they get involved with health research at UTS and, and especially how can they get advice and support when it comes to considering um, things like vulnerability in their development? Thank you for those questions. That question. If they would like to contact either Joe Travalia or myself. So something here. Uh, we had nothing to do with this in terms of development, but um, I heard about this app just the other day and I thought it's a lovely one to show. So the app down there is um, it's called Sunny and basically the statistics are that women and girls with disability are more likely to experience abuse and so this app was developed for them. And one of the things that I think is really clever is that you c they can hide the app so it looks like a weather app which is that first um, screen. So the person, if they're living in, a, in an environment where they're being abused, the person doesn't realise that's what the app is. So again, that's that's a really lovely example of thinking about the vulnerability, the process, but also um, what the design is like. Thank you, Joy. I think that's a great example of thinking about our vulnerable populations as part of the design and being innovative. Were there any questions in the room? We've got time for just one um, uh, before we move on to our final speaker. Um, All right, well, we might move on. Great, thank you. Okay, so the final speaker for today, I would like to introduce Michaela. So Michaela is a digital user experience researcher and clinical engagement and patient safety manager at eHealth. You're on the team. Um, Michaela works with project teams across eHealth incorporating a user-centred design approach to the development of digital clinical solutions. 
In her role, Michaela employs core methodologies such as contextual inquiry as a means of building empathy and understanding of clinical users and our digital applications and understanding user requirements. Her aim is to support patient safety with pragmatic clinical engagement and a user-centred approach to the design and development of e-health digital solutions. Michaela has a background in medical anthropology, a PhD, Master of Applied Anthropology and a um, Bachelor in Social Anthropology and worked in academic, NGO and corporate settings. Um, Michaela has understandings in critical social experiences and in the development of law policy, product design and medical practice. Welcome. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you today about um, yeah, understanding the importance of user experience design in app design and development, uh, what user experience design is and when to engage this type of research and validation. So I want to take you through four different areas today. So I'll be going through and defining, defining user experience design and how this re, uh, relates to user-centered design. I'll, I'll also take you through some of the other terms that you've probably heard in relation to this, and I think that's been raised. Rob was raising design thinking, or talked us through that already, um, so I might skip that part. Um, and there's also usability, um, human-centered design, human factors. So we hear a lot of these terms, and they, they seem to melt together into being the same thing. So after going through each of these elements, I'd like to tell you a bit about um, user experience research and how this relates to user experience design. Uh, and then finally, um, in this process, which methodologies to use when in a design process. And I'll give you a couple of, a couple of examples as well of how we use it at eHealth. So according to the International Standards Organization, or ISO as it's normally um, um, the acronym, uh, Human-centered design is an approach to interactive systems development that aims to make systems usable and useful by focusing on the users, their needs, and the, impro the approach um, enhances effectiveness and efficiency, improves human well-being, user satisfaction, accessibility and sustainability, and counteracts possible adverse effects of use on human health, safety, and performance. Um, which is a huge aim. Uh, and then the user experience, user experience design itself is all about enhancing user satisfaction. So it's an additional element to that by improving usability, accessibility, and also pleasure in the interaction, which would be great if we could bring that into the medical world as well. So HCD or, and UCD are basically all about shifting design away from simply implementing the latest technology or um, designing sort of for the designer with just a focus on functionality with one person in a room thinking uh, about what might be needed um, and toward building empathy for users and starting with what the problem is, which is what you guys have spoken to today, which is great that we're all in line with, uh, with that. Um, so these uh, HCD and UCD developed from earlier um, disciplines like usability and human-computer interaction which were traditionally more focused on uh, functionality. Um, and usability is just a, it's a component of UCD. It's a smaller component of it, but it's not quite the same thing. So it normally comes in at the stage of testing. Um, so it's about testing that um, the degree to which the design is fit for purpose um, and sits within the, under the umbrella of user experience, um, as in, does this design do what it says it should do? Um, and this comes after the design process, whereas user experience comes in from the very beginning. So I've got a nice long paragraph about design thinking that I can skip because I think Rob did a great job of explaining that. Um, so basically, XCD and UCD are approaches to design that focus on user experience and not just the functionality of the design. So it's a big step forward in the design world um, and it's all about uh, focusing on the problem and building empathy for the user, which is where user experience research comes in. So user experience research informs the user-centered design process. It's, uh, it is a, it's at the very beginning of the process. Um, and what they would refer to as pre-discovery in the design standards that the DTA developed. Um, and it, it just becomes, comes before anything else. 
but I'll explain as well that it can come sort of in the middle uh, of, of a process as well if um, on a sort of rescue mission when it hasn't been included at the beginning. Um, so you could say that user experience research is um, just speaking to people, but it's actually more scientific or it follows a methodological a method, methodical approach um, and process. So UX research draws on methodologies developed by disciplines that have a long history and working toward understanding people and getting to the truth of human experience, um, such as psychology and anthropology, and I should include sociology as well, are all uh, disciplines that inform uh, UX research. They all endeavour to understand human experience. So psychology, on the one hand, is about understanding the individual and their cognition. Um, uh, anthropology is all about understanding the person in society and how societal and cultural structures influence and shape experience, perception and behaviour. So uh, methodologies that come from psychology are qualitative and quantitative. They're about numbers as well as speaking to people. Um, and the quantitative elements like surveys, for example, uh, and tests give us an overall understanding of normative behaviours and perceptions, as you were explaining earlier, about finding that norm um, and standard. Whereas anthropological methods don't seek to control behaviour. Uh, it's all about understanding how context and structures influence behaviour. Um, and it's mainly all about the qualitative. So we have uh, participant observation and ethnography, um, and you can also call that ethnography contextual inquiry. Uh, and they're the core methods. It's about, uh, these methods are about full immersion uh, in the context of uh, people being studied and learning about their worldview, um, which is difficult in the process of design. You're not going to go and live with people for years and years and follow them around and live with them. Um, so it's really about dipping in and out of those worlds when it comes to the design process. So going back to UX research, we take a little bit from all of these uh, methodologies and disciplines. So what we tend to use at eHealth is a triangulation method where we're using a, a mix of methodologies, qualitative and quantitative, often a survey that includes, includes demographic data so that we have a good understanding of who we're speaking to. Um, and if any issues emerge, if that might relate to gender, or if it might relate to age, or if it might relate to um, a, their role, or anything like that, where we'll see a trend. Um, we'll also use participant observation, and sometimes even just simple tallies when we're looking at what people are doing. Um, and I often use film and photograph as well. So a core part of this is thinking carefully about um, what it is that you're looking to find out and keeping your questions broad enough, um, which is a component of UX research that can be overlooked. Um, so it's a good idea to develop your intro interview instruments really carefully and run those by your, your team um, and really think about um, how you're phrasing the questions and how they're um, ordered, if it's a logical sequence. And really importantly, something that I come across here and there is avoiding asking leading questions. So um, you, if you're going up to a person and you want to know what their favourite colour is, you would ask what's your favourite colour, not is your favourite colour blue, um, because they're keeping the answer, which sounds quite obvious, but it's an easy thing to slip into. So apart from the methodological and instrument design, um, you also need to consider who you'll be speaking with. So that's something that's... Um, a really important consideration. So the aim is to speak with a representative sample in relation to what you think the problem might be or the project topic. Um, so it tends for us, it tends to be metropolitan, regional and rural. Um, and then we'll also speak with clinical consultants and identify which units and roles we need to be thinking about when we're going in and observing and speaking with people. So once you've got all of this in place, um, you're ready to go and gather experiences um, and then you need to bring all of that back and go through the analysis phase. So this is, um, uh, it's important to get everybody in the room and really think about what your themes are and match them up with your observations because it's really easy to introduce a bias in just assuming that one thing that you saw is a rule um, and make sure that you take everybody's perspectives into, into consideration when you're doing your analysis. So the output of this work um, can be a number of different things. It might be a report, it might be personas, um, and I would norm I would encourage a set of personas rather than sort of one standard one. So um, you want to represent all your different roles and and the different um, 
um, extremes within those roles as well. Journey maps, experience maps um, and scenarios are all the different kinds of outputs you might end up with. Um, so reports are useful when you want to look at conveying some of the uh, core contextual um, observations that you um, that relate to the project. They're useful in identifying, um, communicating the requirements, um, hazards and things like that that really need to be documented. And personas are great for just keeping the design team on track um, and making sure that we keep the users and that various, that varied um, array of roles um, in mind. And journey maps is something that you can use similarly. I thought your example was really great, Rob. Um, yeah, and scenarios are really important to develop at this stage as well at the beginning of a research project so that you can come back and test using those scenarios. I imagine some of this might sound very familiar to a lot of you, but this is all about building empathy and designing an appropriate methodology with appropriate instruments with the aim of understanding the problem or identifying a problem, building empathy for your users so that the design solves a problem in an appropriate way, not a problem that you think might be there, but um, what you've actually found to be uh, a true issue. So I've taken you through what HCD is, its design, and it's all about design and em building empathy for your users and how this uh, relates to user experience and is informed by user experience research. Um, but what is the value of this approach? I think I lost my clicker. Here it is. Uh, so what I wanted to take you through, yes. So the um, who here has an iPhone? Hands up. Okay, most people. Um, do you like your iPhone? Put your hand up if you like it. Yeah, okay, that's good. And how many people here use Google as your main search engine? All right, great. So these are all products that were developed using user experience design, and they're way ahead of us. They're way ahead of health um, in terms of putting their customer at the center and creating products that people love. And um, it would be great if we catch up, uh, catch up with this in health and create products that clinicians love to use and that function really well and focus on patient safety. Um, so a really good example of um, user experience being at the heart of design is Samsung. So before 1996, Samsung basically um, had a lot of cheap electronic products that they would just put a skin on that were not that different to anything else out there on the market. Um, in 1996, uh, they introduced um, basically a panel of design expertise and innovation um, and created design-centered culture so that Samsung would become a global competitor. Um, so their new multidisciplinary team were at the heart of this new culture um, and one of the methods that they employed was ethnography. So during one of their ethnographic studies, they looked at um, people's use and experience of televisions in their homes. So they hung out with lots of families and looked at how they were placing their televisions and using them. Um, and what they found was that people were hiding their televisions. They were putting them in cabinets um, or behind cupboards. And they wanted them to be out of the way, which is um, inverse to what Samsung expected. They thought that TVs were something that you showed off and they were a status symbol. But in fact, they weren't. They were seen as pretty ugly um, and it was all about the screen. So they went back and uh, looked at, took these um, views into account and developed the flat screen television, which is all about the screen and having the television disappear into the background. So that was over 20, 20, almost 25 years ago. Um, so that's the, that's the product of bringing user experience into your design product um, process. So starting with the user's experience and really understanding how different roles engage with a problem, Technology or situation, for example, is all about problem solving and following, having, following users in the process of your design. So with the UX approach, you're far more likely to see a return on your investment. There's a great little um, formula that if anybody's interested, you can email me and I'll send you the formula. Um, and it, it shows you how employing UX gives you a great return on your investment, which basically means users are likely to use the product that you produce, and they might even really enjoy using that product. So our main tips are that we'd really love it that if you have a, an innovative idea to get in contact with eHealth, um, we'd, we love hearing from you and we love um, working with our clinicians on their innovative ideas. So it can feel faster developing it on your own, um, at your own site or within an LHD. 
um, but we can offer support, advice, expertise and governance in these processes and importantly, as it's been pointed out a few times, um, working out whether any of these initiatives are already going so that we're not doubling up on our efforts. Um, and it would be great if any ideas that you come up with could end up being a solution for the whole state. Uh, and I guess the most important thing to remember is uh, to start with experience, um, not the latest technology on the market. So we'd love to hear from you if you have any ideas. So do get in contact. Thank you. <laughs>